I'm excited that in our four summer camps this summer, we have over 800 kids participating, 350 leaders, yeah. That impacts students, that impacts students' families, that impacts the leaders who go with them. It's just such a big thing. And I also am really just thankful to be able to say that not one kid was excluded because of finances, because of you. And so we are just so grateful. Um, also this summer, we're excited about summer meetups happening. If you just want to hang out, this is a big church and it's hard sometimes to get to know people. It's the most common thing that I hear from people. I'm just trying to get connected. I'm trying to get plugged in. I'm trying to make friends, all the things. And so we're having summer meetups and there are over the course of the summer will be over 60 of them. They're happening all over Washington County. Um, you can check the website and find a group to jump into. They've got all kinds of fun ideas. I signed up for a couple of them this morning. I wanted to just keep signing up for all of them, but I thought that was irresponsible. So I didn't. But one of them's a waffle breakfast. So who's not going to sign up for that? Not me. Um, so sign up for that. Just fun things happening here. We've got tons of cool stuff launching in the fall. But for summer, I think the name of the game is community. We just want to be community and we want to be a family together here at Before. We do that on Sundays. I love, I know summer is just, it's hard sometimes. I love in Bend, we used to like look out the church windows and see the boats lined up in the parking lot for as soon as the service was over. Um, and I know sometimes it can be hard to just get up and come on a Sunday, but I'm so thankful when we can be together like this. And the pancakes were particularly good this morning as well. So we're, we've been in an Ephesian series and I had a message planned in the Ephesian series this morning and there's been a, I, I felt like the Holy Spirit took a little detour it's not entirely out of Ephesians, but it is a little bit out of Ephesians. And I just feel like this is something God is speaking to us this morning. And it was important to interrupt the flow of what was already happening in order to teach this word. And so every time the Holy Spirit interrupts a flow, let's just pay attention. There's a reason. There's a reason we that he wants to say something today about this. So a couple of weeks ago, we, taught, we looked at the scripture, Ephesians 4, uh, 1, and it's just simple. It says, therefore I, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. We talked about how every human has received a calling from God, whether or not they acknowledge it, whether or not they walk into it. There, God has called you to something. He has created you for a purpose, put you here for a reason. And that calling is weighty. It is. It's, it matters. And so the way that we walk in the calling, Paul says, walk worthy. That word worthy is the Greek word axios. And the word axios is the word for when you have those old fashioned scales and you want to find a pound of flour, you put a one pound weight on one side and then you start putting flour on the other side until the scales balance. And that's what this word means. It means the way you walk is worthy. It's, it's leveled out with the weight of the call of God on your life. And this is the best way to walk. It's the happiest way. It's the most fulfilling way. It's the safest way. It's the best way. It's the most fruitful way. It's the way, here we say it at before, it's the way of hope, healing, freedom, and flourishing. It's that way. And we want to walk worthy of that calling. And so I was thinking recently about what's most likely to stop us. What's most likely to stop us as individuals and what's most likely to stop us as a church? What's most likely to get in the way of us walking worthy of the call of God on our life? And there are a few things on that list, but there's one I particularly want to talk about today because this one is the one that I've seen the most in my life. This is the one that I've seen sideline people, good people, people with good intentions, people who want to walk worthy, people who want to be able to carry weight, kingdom weight, and do exploits. And I, But this is the thing that I've seen more than any of them. By the way, I have a, a wound on my hand that is distracting, and I would like to have a good story about this. Like you should see the other guy. I really, you know, or I was in an iron woman competition or a something. I was walking and texting is what happened in NFL. So that's, that's what that is. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, 
just walking and texting is all, there's a little dip in my sidewalk. And before, you know that moment where you realize, oh, I'm going down. Oh, it's, I'm, I'm going to hit the ground and it's not going to be good. And instead of you should see the other guy, I will say you should see my leg. It's really, really bad. So back on the main road here, <laughs> there's this one thing that I think keeps us distracted and stuck more than any other thing. And it's not suffering, it's not failure, it's not inability, it's not insecurity, it's not lack of education, it's something else entirely. And so I want to read to you a couple of weird little stories from the Bible. They're not stories we teach on very often, but they're important for what this is. Um, This one's out of Matthew 11. It says, now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Where was John? Where was John? In prison. John was in prison. Now, John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. In fact, he's the first witness to Jesus from the womb. John knows, recognizes Jesus. And then we see John in John chapter one or two come on the scene preaching hellfire and brimstone. He's preaching and he's the locust and honey guy, but he's saying, I am here to prepare the way for the Messiah who is Jesus. So John is Jesus' cousin, but John is also a witness to the lordship of Jesus. He always has been. He's a witness from the womb, but now where is he? Prison. And in prison, his question is this. Are you who you say you are? Is it true? Or do we look for somebody else? John's sitting in prison at the whim of a spineless king married to a really mean wife. He's in prison waiting his fate. And Jesus hasn't done anything to get his cousin out. And so he sends his disciples and Jesus answers them and says, go and tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now this must have been an interesting thing for John to hear in prison or for the disciples to hear Um, because Jesus is like, hey, tell my cousin, I just... I just healed a blind guy I've never met before. I just, I just took care. I mean, I'm, I'm pulling money out of fish mouths so that the disciples can pay their taxes. I'm doing a lot of great, great stuff for a lot of people, just not you. And John's question from prison is, are you really who you say you are? This is not how I thought this would go. Wouldn't you think if your cousin was the Messiah, you would be connected for some perks? There would be some kind of something that'd be cool with that? Wouldn't you think it wouldn't be the thing that gets you thrown in prison and then he pretty much ignores your plight? And so Jesus says not just this to them. He also adds a line to it. He says, tell John the blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. He's quoting scripture to John here about what the Messiah will do. The dead are raised up and the poor of the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. The first time this story became real to me, my husband had just been diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And he was home one day while I was at work. And I came home and I found him on the couch. And he was just in the stage of the disease where he was processing what his life was going to look like for the next couple of years. And he read this story to me. And by the time he got to the end of it, there were just tears pouring down his face. And he said, I will not be offended with Jesus. I will not. I will not be offended with Jesus. No matter how this road goes, no matter how ugly it gets, no matter how short it is, no matter how much I want it to be different, I will not be offended with Jesus. And he held to that. 
An offense by Webster's definition is an annoyance or resentment brought about by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or one's standards or principles. But offend in the Greek in this verse means to entrap, to entice away to sin, to literally get carried away into an offense that you can't get out of. This is just where you live now, in this offense. And we are a society of outrage. We kind of love to be offended right now. We, we, we're ready. We've got the eagle eye. We're looking for it. I dare you to say you like pancakes when I like waffles. How dare you insult waffles by saying you like pancakes? How dare you? We've got this kind of culture of outrage. How do you change a culture of outrage? By changing the people. It has to change one person at a time. And so even in the church, we've developed this culture of criticism and cynicism and outrage, and we get stuck in offense so easily. Here's another story, Mark 6. Jesus went on from there and came to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these ideas, they asked. What is this wisdom he has been given? And how can he perform such miracles? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us as well? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own household is a prophet without honor. So he could not perform any miracles there except to lay his hands on a few of the sick and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. If you're going to be amazing to Jesus, maybe do it for a better reason. He was amazed at their unbelief and he could not perform any miracles because they were offended at him because of their offense. If you think offense is just something that you hide in the background of your life, not true. It matters. It matters when we say we want this to be a house of healing. We want God to touch down here. We want him to meet people in their affliction and in their anxiety and in their depression and despair. If we have a fence that keeps him at a distance, that keeps him from actually moving in our lives, it's time to get to it. It's time to get at it. It's time to say, I, I, I was made for more than this. I want to walk worthy of the call of God on my life. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to deal with some offense. In this scripture, we see how familiarity breeds contempt. The place you work and the people you serve become your hometown. It's easy to become a critic. And that's not always bad. It's okay to evaluate things unless it becomes cynicism, which becomes like cyanide in our lives, in our system. It becomes toxic, and then it spreads through us. In fact, Ephesians 4.30 says this, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. This is a big one. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What's he about to say grieves the Holy Spirit? He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, as in Christ, God forgave you. That word brawling does not mean throwing fists. That word brawling means clamoring against one another. It's throwing words. That brawling is a different thing, and I see it all over the place. Just spend any amount of time on social media. There's brawling everywhere. Word fights breaking out everywhere. And then it says, get rid of every form of malice. Malice means wretched wickedness, and it's where we get our word malignant. It spreads through a body. It spreads through a heart. It spreads through a family. It spreads through a church. It spreads through an a office or a, a, a corporation. It spreads through a government. It spreads through a nation. Bitterness and offense can just spread through and keep us from ever understanding what it is that God wants to do with us and in us and through us. How do we deal with it? Paul just says, get rid of it. <laughs> That's pretty much it. We can all go home. Just get rid of it. You don't want to make room for that. And let me make it clear too. 
There are real wounds in life, for sure. There's real pain. I'm not suggesting we invalidate our pain, we walk away from emotions, pretend it didn't exist, pretend they don't happen. I am suggesting, though, that we start to evaluate our pain a little more critically, that we start to look at it a little more seriously because someone honking at you in traffic isn't trauma. Someone trying to run you off the road in traffic is, in fact, trauma. But we start to throw around these terminology and psychobabble after a while that makes it seem like all pain is meant to take us under. All pain is not meant to take you under. Some of it's not as big as we make it. Some of it really needs to be looked at and dealt with. It's a big deal. So we have to understand there's this, well, we deal with it in offense with each other, with your spouse, with your parents, with your coworkers, with strangers who don't share your opinions, with people who don't know how to use the roundabouts in Bend, Oregon. We have to deal with it. Yes. <laughs> we deal with it because some things are not as big. Some things are just a fence, it just bugs me. But if we let it stay, it can become something that entraps us and sticks in us. All pain matters and all pain can teach us something. But let's get good at critically evaluating the things that are costing us energy. Because if we go into this election season, yes, I did say it. If we go into this election season being prepared with an eagle eye out to be offended by everyone who disagrees with us, we are not gonna have one ounce of energy left for kingdom impact. We're not. Have your opinions, love them, have them. But don't be offended that people don't share them because we are called to love everyone and we're called to be able to live without offense as much as we can. We're called to be, dare I say it, unoffendable. I, oh, I like this crowd. So you guys are so much better than the nine o'clock. Honestly, their responses offended me a lot. <laughs> no, <clears throat> they were awesome. Um, my friend Steve Mickle preached last weekend and I uh, had asked him to speak and then I had to juggle some things around. And he said, listen, Bo, if it's, if it's a problem at all, just... You can, you can uninvite me. I am unoffendable. And I, that gave me so much comfort with him. And then I thought, that's not true. I could offend him. I mean, I, I know I could hurt him. It's not, he's not like made of steel. He's an actual human. I could say something that brought him pain. I've watched him walk through difficult situations with people. He wasn't saying to me, you don't have the power to hurt me. He was saying to me, you can't hurt me in a way that will make me walk away from this relationship. He was saying to me, I'm not in control of how you treat me, but I'm in control of how I respond to how you treat me. I'm in control of what I do when offense lands in my life. And it gave me so much security in my relationship with him. And also, we're in it about 20 years now. I know this is true of him. I know it, and I want to be that kind of person that can be pretty much unoffendable. Not that I don't experience pain, not that I don't have pain, but pain doesn't have me. That's what I want, and that's what I want for us, because I want us to have exponential kingdom impact. So what do we do with the offenses? I think the first thing is just face it. Turn toward the pain instead of away from it. With each other, with Jesus, inside your own self, with your therapist, face your pain. Face your offense. Ask yourself, why am I offended and is this offense serving or sabotaging me? Decide when it's time to let it go and then let it go. There's a song somewhere about that. <clears throat> Don't know how to deal with it? Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit, how do I deal with this? Where do I go with this pain? What do you want to do with it? I recently felt this sort of low-grade offense with my husband, and hard to believe, and um, I let it like sit there, and it wasn't like, it wasn't like right there, but it was sort of like in the waiting room, like waiting for the receptionist to call it in, like I'll get to you in a minute, but I could, I could feel it like 
back there, this thing of like, I think he hurt my feelings. I think he, that thing he did, and I don't even remember what it was anymore. So that tells you a little bit about the level of my offense. Um, but I was like, I don't, I, I think he hurt my feelings. And so it was kind of like when a balloon floats down, you either let it fall to the ground or you keep like popping it up. You just keep hitting it up and it's in front of you. Then there's that balloon and there it is. And we're keeping it in the air and it's still there. It's still there. And so finally, and you know, Husbands, I'm not going to speak for every wife. God forbid I would speak for every wife. But I will say that lots of us have a little waiting room. And when we seem annoyed and you say, how are you? And we say, fine. Sometimes it's just the pains in the waiting room. It's just waiting for a moment when it can come out, when we're going to be ready to acknowledge it and bring it out to the surface. And so I decided I'm going to just turn toward this. And so I said to him, I just need you to know that really hurt my feelings, this thing that you did. And Cliff's really good about taking on and owning whatever is his. And he said, I'm really sorry you're hurt. Do you hear the language coming? (laughs) I'm really sorry you're hurting, but I also don't think you should be. Because that wasn't wrong what I did. And as I heard myself say what I said, and as I heard him say it back to me, I was like, shoot, he's right. He's totally right. I'm wrong. I have taken on an offense that is completely unfair. And I would have sworn to you I was right until I got it out and started talking about it. Face it. Look at it. Process it with somebody else and figure it out. But don't let it just sit there making you think that all of life is unfair. Um, it's, It's really, really important because offense can take us captive it, it can, and, and I think it's just important for me to learn to be more resilient with my pain. I'm just not gonna let everything hit me, knock me down, I'm just not. There's a lot of real pain in life. I can't afford to be offended at the person at Winco that takes too long in line. Can't afford it, there's too much going on. I need to love them. And then after you face it, release it through forgiveness, through letting the balloon drop. And so why is it so hard for us to let the balloon drop? Because it is, it's hard. I went through a ministry situation that was really hard probably 30 years ago. And I remember just like, we, we kind of resolved it. We parted ways. We forgave each other. I really did feel like I literally have forgiven the offender But I would wake up in the middle of the night just replaying conversations in my head, replaying things I thought were unfair in my head, just going around and around this whole situation over and over again. And I kept saying, Jesus, I want to be free of this. I do. I know. And I did know I did want to be free of it. I didn't know how. And I had a dream one night that I was standing at the top of a cliff and there was a raging sea beneath me. And at my feet, there was a a like a trunk, a chest. And in the chest, there was all kinds of papers and they were all the conversations that had been a part of that situation. Every hurtful word, every misunderstanding, every frustration, it was all of it there. And I knew what was coming. I know God, I know what he's gonna do. He says, throw it in the sea. And I'm like, that's a great idea. I don't want to. Why don't I want to? And I thought about it and thought about it and I realized it's because this trunk contains all of my hurt and pain and offense, yes. But this trunk also contains all the evidence that I was right. It contains, it's my smoking gun. And what if I go to another church and they ask me to get involved there and I need to explain to them why I am the way I am. I need to explain to them why I don't want to commit, why I don't want to get involved, why I don't trust people because I've been hurt. Look at my trunk. And I was like, shoot, I don't want to do that. I don't want to throw it away and I don't want to keep it. And how long am I going to haul it around? Am I going to move this to every new house? And it was like a lawyer who prepares a great case against a killer. And I'm making my situation sound more dramatic than it was. But the lawyer prepares this great case and it's all in this one file and they drive and they throw it out the window. And I was like, I don't want to let go of the evidence, but I have to if I want to let go of the offense. If I want to let go of the weight of offense and walk worthy of the weight of my calling, I'm going to have to let this go. 
And I did. I threw it in the sea in my dream. And I also said, God, I invite you to take all the memories. I invite you to take away all the things that I want to hold at the ready and say, hey, this is what happened here. And it's hard, but it's good to let go of the evidence. It's good to be willing to burn it. It's good to be willing to say, because this isn't about trusting them, the people that hurt you. This is about trusting God. This is about trusting him that no matter what, he will be with you. No matter what, he will care for you. No matter what, he comes to you with healing and hope and life. And then sometimes our offense is with Jesus. Sometimes it's not with people. It might be an offense with your calling or with the condition of your life. Maybe your life hasn't turned out the way you thought. It might be an offense with the gifts you've been given or the gifts you haven't. How do we deal with it when Jesus is the one that we feel offended by? When we feel like, I'm stuck in prison. Are you or are you not the Messiah? Face it. Same thing. Do it the same way. First, face your pain. Take it to Jesus. Let the pain out of the waiting room. So I'm going to bring it to Jesus or take it to someone who can help you with perspective. Follow the dotted line from your current hurt to any unresolved wounds from the past that have created a breeding ground for offense. Face it and let God deal with it with you. Um, there's a story in the Old Testament. It's kind of a funny story, or sad actually, but the... Um, it's when David and Saul are fighting for the kingdom. And on one day, Saul and all his family are destroyed, all of them except one boy. One boy, his name is Mephibosheth. He's five years old. In all of the tumult, his nanny picks him up and runs with him. She drops him, and he's lame in both feet. And I've had a couple of five-year-olds of my own. I've had four of them. I've probably even dropped a couple of them. And um, I can't figure out a way, unless this nanny was 29 feet tall, that dropping a five-year-old would render him lame in both feet for the rest of his life. And I really believe it's the way of our enemy. Something that should be a normal kind of, ah, that hurt, that was hard, that was sad, becomes a lens through which we see the rest of our lives and the rest of the world and the rest of everything. This people drop you becomes the motto of your life, the t-shirt you wear, the way you do or don't engage in community because something that was just an, a normal kind of part, a painful part, but a kind of normal part of life becomes something that affects the way you walk, the way you see, the way you talk, the way you believe, the way you dream the way you friend people. And I'd love in this next moment, as we take time with the body and blood of Jesus, did I bring my communion up here? I didn't. Um, as we take time with it, as we engage with it, I'm not actually gonna lead you through it. I'm gonna let you just do it during this song. But would you be willing and brave to ask Jesus, what is the dotted line from my pain to my present? Is there any offense in me that I'm holding on to against another person, against Jesus? Is there anything that is in the waiting room making noise, but I just haven't wanted to face it or deal with it? Is there any evidence that I need to be willing to let go of and walk free? Is there any place that God wants to address you today in this place of pain or a place of offense or a place of sorrow? This is good and healthy and safe to be with him in it. So I'm gonna ask you to just take communion whenever you'd like to during this song. Understand that we're, we're, we're gathering around the blood and bread, the blood and body of Jesus, the bread and the juice, the, the blood that pours into our wound and brings healing and life and freedom. So in this time, touch base with him in communion, gather with him at his table and listen to him for what he wants to say to you about any place where offense might be getting the upper hand in your life. And then I'll come back and close this up.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. like danger is everywhere waiting to make us feel sad or hurt or alone or rejected I ask God that you would show us the danger within help us to be willing to take the step to deal with the stuff that keeps us stuck we love you so much we thank you for your goodness in our life we thank you for your grace we thank you for healing memories, healing hurts. Thank you that you're in this room now, even walking through the aisles and you're ready to almost collect from people any of the offenses and the hurts they're willing to put in your hands. Even now, if you just picture them walking through lovingly, asking to carry your heavy stuff for you. If you give him the evidence, you can trust him with your reputation. So 
of Jesus be welcome here in our in this day in this room but throughout this week would you continue your work in us we need you we love you we trust you in your good name we pray amen hey I'm so thankful that you were here this morning thanks you're nice um I just remind you about summer meetups. Sign up for one. Take some friends, maybe some friends who just need community. Do it. It's going to be so good. And then um, benediction. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I could do it. I thought I could save the coffer all the way to the end, but I can't. If you'd like to receive the benediction, would you put your hands out in front of you? May we be people who recognize the beauty of the unoffendable life. May we bring our pain to your open arms as you gather and heal and love us to hope and freedom and flourishing. In the name of the God who took on our offense, we pray. And everyone said, amen. Hey, go with God. We love you so much. We'll see you next weekend.